Hey everybody, welcome. Welcome to Black Blockchain Consultants. It's your girl Cherie here. You know if it's Wednesday, it's blockchain night. So I'm gonna let people come in. I wanna welcome everybody, give people a couple of minutes. If you wanna have a cup of tea, help yourself. If you wanna have some wine or brown liquor, you can do that as well. Tonight's conversation is all about smart cities and it's going to be really good. So hello, Tawana. Hello, my dear. How are we today? Just wonderful, just wonderful. Excited about tonight's conversation. You know, I have to admit, I had heard the term smart cities. I didn't know anything about it. And I, I don't believe my clients are going to be on this. I was supposed to be writing a business plan today. And instead, I'm like researching smart cities. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is a really good topic. Why didn't we do this sooner? <laughs> we may turn into the black uh, smart cities <laughs> consultants. Yeah, I agree. I, I got it as well today because it was a very good topic to research. So I got caught up myself. Yes, yes. Hi, Eric. Hey, Eric. Hey, Juan. How y'all doing tonight? Good, thank you. So we're going to give uh, people just a couple of minutes to come in, get your tea, your wine, <laughs> your, your scotch, whatever it is that you want to drink. You may want to get a pen and a piece of paper as well because... Uh, this will be a good conversation tonight. So, hi, Erin. Hi, Mark. Hey, guys. So in the meantime, while we're waiting for people to come in, I will start with a couple of announcements so that we can uh, get the ball rolling because I actually have a, a lot tonight. Y'all know I usually do like a couple of articles. I, I actually, there were so many of them, but I'm going to do them really fast so they'll come sequentially. Um, and then we'll, you know, we'll do our panel. And, and everyone in the audience, you guys know as well, if you want to... Uh, participate in the conversation, you can just raise your hand and get on the panel as well. I forgot to put us on Facebook, so hold on one second. Let me uh, put us on Facebook really quickly as well. Yeah, I was so excited about the topic that <laughs> I forgot my, my uh, routine here. But while I'm putting us up, up on Facebook, uh, I will give the announcements uh, as well. So the first thing is just explaining again what BBC is and what we do. Um, we are a group of people that focuses on four primary things. So the first is blockchain jobs, you know, just understanding what the industry is overall and the opportunities that are available with regards to careers. We also focus on uh, blockchain businesses that you can start, some of them for very little to no cost. Um, la on Monday, two days ago, for our inner circle, we had a great discussion on some of the blockchain uh, businesses that you can start based on the mass adoption that's gonna be happening of blockchain. So you wanna check that out. Uh, to get that, you go in the flock and the, um, the link is there. Um, we also talk about investing in the blockchain, whether you wanna invest time or money in blockchain projects. And then the final thing is uh, growing generational wealth. Uh, how do we take the money that we earn from blockchain and set it up so that our grandkids and great grandkids can eat off of it. So that's very important to us. That's our mission is to introduce a million black people in the blockchain and have a secondary mission. You know, we often see, uh, for example, there are certain cultures that, for example, um, seem to dominate the nail salons or convenience stores or, you know, places like that. I would like to see black 
people own a couple of big pieces of the blockchain industry. So I have no idea what parts of those are yet. Eric is definitely buying for tokenization of assets. So we'll see what happens. Um, yeah. Also, we want to invite anyone who is not a part of VBC to consider joining us. We have a lot of inner circle discussions in 2020. You all know that the decade is ending in two months, the decade is ending. So 2020 is gonna be the decade of new technologies, including blockchain, and we wanna get our share. So uh, we invite you to be a part of, you know, what we're doing. We're gonna have a lot more inner circle benefits starting in 2020. Uh, we also have our virtual conference coming up on December 4th. That is a Wednesday, and we're talking about 21st century fundraising. Eric, would you mind telling the people what's going to be happening on that day? Yes, we're going to have discussions with, you know, various thought leaders, people that are founders of certain platforms, maybe even platforms that as you've been in the blockchain space um, that maybe you're familiar with. Uh, we're also going to talk about opportunity zones. I was talking today to an opportunity zone expert. And I'm just really excited too to even dig into that discussion um, that much more. I think many of us may have heard, maybe we may have a you know a cursory knowledge of it, but this is going to be a great chance to get a you know really a, a deeper dive and learn a lot um, about you know it's an amazing you know opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's the word. <laughs> so, yes, and also we're going to talk about crowdfunding too, as well, and 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 how all of those things intersect and how they all can work together in concert with one another. So um, it's going to be an amazing time. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so this uh, particular virtual conference is not just for people who are hardcore into blockchain. It really is for your entrepreneurial friends to understand what they can do now to raise money for their businesses and what's coming in the next five to 10 years so that we can all be smarter entrepreneurs. So um, then Tawana, we have our Atlanta conference coming up February 16th and 17th. Very excited. You want to tell the family, uh, you know, what we're going to have, you know, for our two days. Yeah, we're super excited about the conference. As Sheree said, February 16th and 17th, it's a Sunday and a Monday. It is a president's um, a weekend. So if you're not already off, please ask for that time off and come out and join us in Atlanta. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about ownership. You know, that's the theme for us this year is to really talk about how can we own a piece of this space. Um, you know, we've, we've learned over the last two years, we've spent our time educating ourselves, and now we know that ownership is the way to go and being able to get a piece of that. Um, we've got some great speakers lined up. We've got some um, wonderful sessions where we can get together and talk about the different, the various industries and how blockchain um, kind of fits into that space and how we can leverage those industries to make money. Um, goodness, what else? We've got some... I'm going to share my screen because I just pulled up the Eventbrite. Oh, awesome. 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 <laughs> so that way you can, you can cheat a little bit here. Awesome, awesome. Thank yes. you. Yes. Yeah, so on, on day one, we've got uh, tokenization. So what, one thing we're going to do that's awesome is we are going to tokenize a piece of artwork, right? In real time, we're going to make this happen. Eric is spearheading that initiative. We're super, super excited. You know, we, we've talked about it enough. We want to be about it, right? We want to actually try this. And we're starting with something small like a piece of art. And who knows? The next thing, it could be a piece of property. Um, it could be, you know, a bigger asset, a building, uh, uh, you know, a piece of land, uh, a, a music, a song or something. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying out with something small in the hopes that we grow. Um, then we're going to network a little. And then we're going to talk some more about ownership in the space. And you see, that's the theme, right? Uh, funding our own technology, uh, talking to people who already have built businesses and they, they can guide us. We've got a wonderful keynote speaker, Krista McFarlane with Patientory. We're so excited to have her come out and join us. For anyone who's been a part of the BBC, you know, we've, we've talked uh, to the Patientory crew before and we love what they stand for. And we're really excited to partner with them 
and to have Krista come out and talk to us. Um, and we, we still have some spaces. So if you are a thought leader in this space, reach out to us and let us know what you, what you have to talk about and we'll see if we've got some spaces for you. Uh, the round tables are really interesting. For anyone who came to our conference uh, in 2017, I believe it was, the round tables were a big hit, really talking about the industries. Um, and so we, what we did this time, we only had, I think, like 30 minutes last time. What we did is we extended the time because that was a fan favorite. So we're gonna spend some time talking about the various industries. And these are some listed here, just to name a few. We may add some additional ones. Um, and that's on day one, so that's on Sunday. On day two, we're going to- um, Oh, that is day two. Oh, that, that, that was day two. What was, what, what was day one? Day one is about tokenization. Okay. Tokenization and so finding that's our own podcast. That's, so that's when we do the art. Yeah, that's when we yes. do the art. So we're super, super excited. Please come out and join us. We know it's a, you know, a weekday is thrown in there, but we're hoping that enough people are on vacation that day that they can come out and join us. If you're in Atlanta, this is the place you want to be. Okay? Definitely. This is the place you want to be. And we're so excited to have you. We're super excited. This is year two for us. Uh, with a conference, we hope to make this a, a, a thing, right? And do this every single year. And every year, we hope to get better and bolder and bring topics that people really want to know about. So please come on and join us. Absolutely. So, and we're also going to have, if you have a blockchain book, an entrepreneur book, um, any kind of motivation, personal uh, self-help motivation book, we're also going to have a book table for our inner circle members. So you have to be an inner circle member in order to get access to that, but you'll be able to sell your books on site. And we also have exhibitor tables as well. Uh, you have to go through an application process just because um, Cherie prefers for us to have uh, related blockchain or entrepreneurial related businesses, you know, resume building, uh, career building, you know, um, business consulting, things like that uh, as exhibitors. So you'll reach out to Tawana for that as well. Uh, any final uh, announcements before we go to our topic of the night? Oh, I think we're ready to dive in. Okay, everybody. So we're going to dive in. And I want to start off tonight with the CNBC video because I think it sums it up really well. So let's get started. Your city, chances are it's getting smarter by the year. Many governments around the globe are racing to infuse technology into just about every aspect of its city's operations. And I mean every part, including public transportation, IT connectivity, water and power supply, sanitation and solid waste management, efficient urban mobility, e-government, and citizen participation. And it does this using every buzzword imaginable, from big data to the internet of things. So how does a smart city work? Let's look at three examples. Here in Singapore, the city state might be the gold standard of the most extensive effort to collect data on daily living. The government is now deploying systems that can tell when people are smoking in prohibited zones or littering from high-rise housing. Singapore launched its own Smart Nation program in 2014 and will add more cameras like these so the government can effectively monitor crowd density, cleanliness of public spaces, and even the exact movement of every locally registered vehicle. Much of the data it's collecting will be fed into an online platform called Virtual Singapore that gives the government access to how the city is functioning in real time. It could help the government predict how crowds might react to an explosion in a shopping mall or how infectious disease might spread. Over in Dubai, more than 50 smart services from 22 government entities have been rolled out as part of the government's Smart Dubai initiative. Using the government-provided app Dubai Now, you can do things like pay a speeding ticket, which likely captured you on a public camera and then emailed you the ticket directly. You can also use the same app to pay your electric bill, call a taxi, track a package you sent to your friend, find the nearest ATM, renew your vehicle registration, track the visa status of a relative, and report a violation to the Dubai police. Now, head over to Barcelona, 
where one research firm estimates the city will save billions of dollars a year in energy costs just by installing smart systems like these. Number one, smart streetlights. Public lighting that adapts and dims when there's no activity but brightens up when sensors detect motion. The second, parking sensors. Instead of driving in circles looking for a spot to park, drivers can get real-time information on an app which locates free parking spots. Sensors on the street curb use lighting and metal detectors to know if a parking spot or loading area is occupied. And finally, garbage sensors, which are actually compact drop-off containers which have a vacuum network through pipes which sucks up trash below ground. The automated waste collection not only lowers noise pollution from garbage trucks, but also lowers costs and keeps bad odor away. Juniper Research estimates that by 2021, cities will save nearly $19 billion by making their cities smart. But of course, to save money, sometimes you have to spend it first. The global smart city market is estimated to attract $15 billion by 2021. And that's just for software. So now companies from Microsoft to Cisco are aiming for a piece of it. In Singapore, Upton Saidi, CNBC. Okay, so I'm going to stop that for a minute. What did you think? <laughs> so when I first saw the video earlier today, I thought, I love this idea. And then it kicked in. This is kind of the future, right? When we look, mm -hmm. when we think about some of the movies we saw growing up, you know, like Minority Report and Blade mm -hmm. Runner and Fifth Element and all those movies, it's like we are seriously about to be there. Like even the Jetsons, I'm like, we are getting ready to do this finally. Now, when he talks about saving the money, of course, the next thought that came in is who pays for this, right? Mm -hmm. Is it us? You know, it's tax taxpayer money. Absolutely. Yeah, taxpayer money. Yeah. So you tap into big business somehow, and instead of giving them all the tax breaks, they now fund this. More likely, we're going to be funding it. And I don't well, like that, but, but it's exciting. So I'm going to throw something in there. Cities now are doing a lot of what's called public-private partnerships. I'm not saying that that's going to happen with this, but I'll give you an example. There's a toll road, um, the Dulles Toll Road, that is out where we are um, in Virginia. And I think it's owned now by the Chinese. And in fact, the Chinese wanted to change the signs to Chinese. And the citizens in that part of, because it's like getting close to rural Virginia, they went in such an uprise that they had to change those signs back to American, like no, sorry, English, like American English, you know. Um, so we're starting to see some of this happening and we're actually starting to see the privatization of a lot of public things that used to be public um, okay. services as well. So if anyone's uh, interested, it's called public private partnerships. And what will happen is the government will have something that they want to do when they call on private industry and then the private industries get to make the money off of it as well. So like, the, the ticketing and things like that that they showed in the CNBC. Speaking of that, I got a ticket like that as well. I was driving, no cop pulled me over. Mm -hmm. And like three weeks later in DC, you know, three weeks later, they mailed something to my Virginia, <laughs> Virginia address. You know, I mean, it was like 25 bucks. So I wasn't going to fight them over that. I was like, okay, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, it yeah. happened to us in Orlando and they actually send you the little video. So you mm -hmm. can't dispute it. Like, yep, that's the Yeah, call. that's you. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. Well, okay. Listen, I, I, obviously, it's, it's like a lot of things in life. I see the benefit. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I, I cringe a little bit at the surveillance piece that he's, you know, that he was talking about. I mean, listen, I would this be great as a crime deterrent? Yes, I would love to see that. That'd be fantastic. If, if they if they if they can um, identify the right person. I know. See, that <laughs> that's, that's the problem. You know, that's so don't even say that. Right? I know, but see, this is what's going to happen, and, and this is and and, and and we already know it's just not going to be yeah. this is smooth ascension. Where oh my gosh, now we're in this great utopian city where everything. Right. 
like we already know it's not going to be there. There are going to be some sort of casualties along the way. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of a little bit of my concern. Now, energy consumption, um, you know, of just reducing energy waste, um, you know, even like the cleanliness aspect, which I've heard Singapore is one of the cleanest, cleanest modern, you know, large cities that you're ever going to find. And I, I, I mean, that would be fantastic just to have it um, being able to, especially with our landfills and, you know, mm -hmm. like, I mean, we're awful with that here. I mean, yeah, we're trying could you, to- Could you clean up? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I'm thinking, could you clean up the hood? Um, yes. And then yeah, what would happen absolutely. to the property values, you know, in, in those areas? And what would happen if uh, somebody's walking down the street and they litter in the hood, let's say, they litter, and then all of a sudden they get a ticket, you know, to, uh, to have to pay uh, for littering. So, yeah, I mean, you know. I want to show you guys a couple of additional things, if you don't mind. Um, so our very own Krista McFarlane, who is going to be a speaker at the uh, Atlanta conference, wrote this. And because you may be asking, what does smart cities have to do with blockchain? She's asking, are smart, are smart cities the pathway to blockchain and cryptocurrency adoption? Because smart, because there's a statistic that says over 60% of the population is going to be living in urban areas or suburban areas in the next uh, decade or so. So these cities, and I'm going to show you some of the cities that are fighting now to become smart cities. You know, this is going to be happening everywhere across the globe, even in Africa. And I have an article to show with you, to share with you with regards to even in the remotest areas of Africa where these technologies are going to start penetrating. Um, but Chris's point with this, she explains what smart cities are, how she attended uh, a conference. And then she says down here, um, she has the use cases. She talks here about the infrastructure being used, being need to, uh, having the need for blockchain to ensure privacy and security of data. That's why I really wanted Talisha to be here tonight because she would have been, <laughs> and she would have actually said it before I showed this article. <laughs> but the use of blockchain for identification in a smart city can assist with proof of citizenship, voting for public office and tax data. In addition to security and fraud measures, the elimination or paperwork under such a system connects right with the smart city initiative to manage and reduce pollution and waste. Other typical services include the use of internet centers to detect road maintenance or other general repairs, connection of home utilities and rent to the blockchain, as well as healthcare services. Blockchain healthcare networks which store protected health data information can be useful when considering emergency situations that involve individuals in a crisis providing beneficial to certified, oh sorry, proving beneficial to certified first responders in accessing pertinent medical information. So basically what um, Chris is saying here is there could be a stranger in the street and all of a sudden the paramedics are able to come and see the full vitals on that person, um, you know, without their relatives or anybody else being in the vicinity. So I, I, I actually, I started um, thinking about this topic because I read Chris's article here in Forbes. Okay. And you're able to read her entire article as well, but blockchain, is according to Krissa, and most of us would agree, blockchain is gonna to have to be the underlying force because it secures data. And this whole smart city is built on data. And if there are data vulnerabilities and data breaches, mass adoption cannot happen. It just can't. 
So then you may be asking yourself, well, so what are hap what are some of the smart cities in the United States? So I found two different articles here that have a whole bunch of different cities, but uh, 10 of them that this group route match talks about is Boulder, Colorado. They have um, an energy grid that they're working on. Then Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I was like, Pittsburgh? Apparently, uh, they are reinvesting in infrastructure because of a decreasing population. They're using, I'm not sure if this is still uh, out there or not, IBM Smarter Cities mm -hmm. is, you know, so people who want to work for IBM, you can check this out, see if they still have it. Um, they have worked on Move PGH, their transportation improvement plan, which will make the city more bike and pedestrian friendly. Um, so again, this is from 2017. You can see if this uh, information is still, uh, you know, still valid. San Francisco with smart parking systems. Louisville. Look at that. Oklahoma. My city made the map. You made the list. What are we yes. doing here that's smart? <laughs> <laughs> it says here, um, while many people may only know of it as the host of Kentucky Derby, Louisville has also distinguished itself as a leader in smart technology. Its initiatives include a data-driven application for inhalers to reduce mm -hmm. asthma risk and transportation efforts like a plan for a smart lane for connected vehicles. Like the other cities on the list, Louisville is using technology to look to the future. So it looks like they're working on stuff within transportation in your city. Interesting. Very interesting. You got Fresno here. I, I want to come back to something here when they mentioned the smart inhalers and in healthcare. And I'm not going to say this with regards to who to vote for or anything like that. I just want to put it in perspective of healthcare is America's number one issue. It is the costliest issue. On the Democratic side, you've got Bernie Sanders and now Elizabeth Warren saying Medicare for all, you know, really pushing health care. Um, on the Republican side, they've been trying to deal with it in their own way and are going to continue to do so. America is scheduled to go bankrupt because of mm. our unhealthiness just overall as a country. Mm -hmm. And these smart cities are going to have to deal with this along with if it's ever Medicare for all or whatever healthcare system because we're getting older and older and we're living longer even though we're sicklier, you know. Um, so I just kind of want people to think about it in terms of technology and politics and how all of these things intertwine. And again, this is not vote Democrat or Republican. This is just looking overall globally, macro wise, in terms of what's happening and being smart about it and asking yourself, how can I place myself strategically uh, based on that? So. All right, Fresno, uh, it's in California, mid-sized city. They had projects to implement a city stat model to share and track data and improve transportation through adaptive intelligent transportation system. Uh, LaGrange, Georgia has 30,000 people and they were looking at a smart grid system for a, their advanced broadband network. Columbus, Ohio. So Lorna, I don't know if Lorna's out there tonight, but uh, Ohio is in the news here. Um, they were, they won a DOT grant for something or other, not seeing exactly what this is. Austin, Texas doesn't surprise me. Austin, just for technology, is one of the biggest uh, cities now uh, with regards to technology. They're kind of like the Silicon Valley of Texas. So if you want to move to Texas, consider moving to Austin. 
Yeah. A lot of jobs there. Dell is about to open in Austin, Texas. I follow this woman who lives in Austin and she's talking about Dell. They're about to open a big headquarters uh, in, ta in Austin. So this doesn't surprise me at all. Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I hear a lot about Iowa as well and a lot of the things that they're doing. And New York City. Well, we're not surprised with New York. They, they desperately need help <laughs> with their transportation. Take it from somebody who knows about that. Um, this here is uh, 12 of the top 50 smart cities in the world are in the United States. So they have some additional cities here. They're listing like Boston, San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle, Charlotte, DC, Columbus, LA, Atlanta, Philly and Kansas City. So again, just wanted to show you these things. And then they're talking here about Africa, what's happening in Africa. So the three technologies that are going to most shape Africa in the coming couple of decades are Internet of Things, smart cities, and low Earth orbit systems. And I'm not going to um, read this entire thing, but they're just saying that uh, Six of the world's 41 mega cities by 2030 will be in Africa. And the world is going digital. A lot of Africans now have cell phones. They have access to certain things, even if they live in the rural parts that they didn't have before. Not all of Africa is poor. You know, that's something that was fed to us by the media. It, it's not true. There's a, a burgeoning um, economy in Africa and the smart cities along with this low earth orbit system will um, bring more technology to the rural areas of Africa. And you can go through and read this article uh, if you want to, but I just wanted to bring that up because some of us either work on the continent or are from the continent and we care about what's happening there as well. But smart cities, smart cities do face certain challenges. So I said, okay, well, let's see what some of the challenges are. Technology challenges with coverage and capacity, digital security, legislation mm -hmm. and policies. So a lot of times technology is far ahead of the legislation. Uh, lack of confidence or reluctance shown by citizens. So again, we continuously refer to this innovation adoption cycle um, where you know right now smart cities is kind of in the innovators early adopter section um, but over time within the cnbc where they said that certain people were going to be able to pay their tickets on their mobile apps there'll probably be a time where everybody has to pay their ticket on their mobile apps mm -hmm. and the late majority and the laggards are going to need help setting that up there's i mean you know uh we we always talk about how these things are going to happen also within this are also going to be certain cities some cities are going to be early adopters and other cities are going to be late majority and laggards you can make money by working with some of the cities that are early adopters becoming really good at, at being the blockchain expert for smart cities and as the early majority and late majority cities come on the cities and the states themselves you could be perfectly positioned to take advantage of that. Um, they also have uh, funding and business models, interoperability, and existing infrastructure for energy, water, and transportation. I only have a couple more things here. So we talked a little bit about the balancing innovation with privacy. I just wanted to show you this just as uh, the headline. Again, I, I, I was going to really prod Talisha with this because this is her thing uh, with regards to data. And then a look at smart cities um, of the future and some of the companies that will benefit. So again, if you want to talk about starting a blockchain business, these are some of the companies that are going 
that are in the forefront that you either want to join forces with, go to work for them, become a subcontractor uh, with them, etc. So they have here, they're saying that the global market for smart cities is going to grow from 308 billion in 2018 to 717 billion by 2023. Okay. Um, blockchain is set to be 3.1 trillion uh, in the next few years. So there's a lot of money there. There are three key smart city sectors, communications, energy, and transportation. And um, I think that was all I wanted to share with this article here. Were those, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I want to share some of the uh, some of the companies that are going to do well or that are ones to watch. So you've got IBM, you've got STM Microelectrics, Honeywell, Ericsson. I don't know what Invincence is, but it looks like they're public company. Uh, Intel, Samsung, social media, Facebook, Tencent, WeChat, Google, YouTube, Amazon online security companies like xCloud and First Trust ISC, um, fintech companies, and then they have key stocks to benefit, Qualcomm, Nokia, Samsung, Verizon, T-Mobile, et cetera, et cetera. You've got the energy space here that's going to have some winners. Um, you got the transportation space that's going to have winners. Again, I'm just trying to get people's minds um, moving. And, you know, as we're thinking about this, about the opportunities that are within smart cities, I've said before, pick a niche, you know, freshman and sophomore year of college, you take your general studies. We, do, we did that in 2018 and the beginning of 2019. Now I suggest you move to junior year, pick a niche, pick an industry or pick a use case or something like that and become the expert and the go-to person. So with that, I am done. So, um, so let me, so let's, so let's unpack some of that. That was a lot of information. That was a lot. Yes. A lot of information. So when we go back to Chris's article about, you know, the, the person laying in the street and you can do vitals and you can also check for identity. So the days of Jane and John Doe, they go away, mm -hmm. right? Missing children. You can't prance them around the street without us being able to find them. Missing people in general, trafficking of humans that diminishes unless you hide them in a dungeon somewhere, right? But you can't, you can't prance them around. You can't teleport them somewhere else. I mean, that we're going to find them. So when you think about that, I'll give up privacy for those things, mm -hmm. right? I'll give up privacy for the street light to come on bright in the alley if I'm walking home late at night mm -hmm. or if I'm on the street alone or if I'm at a bus stop waiting. I'll give up privacy for those things if it ensures safety. And so we, we, we've got to think about the balance, right? And I'm a very private person. So for me to say, I'll give up my privacy, that's deep. But I want to be safe more than anything else. And these, these things that are being presented as possibilities, they, they protect us in a lot of ways. Now, where we have the problem is the lack of communication, right? So it, they, these things can't be just government-based, right? So it's decentralized. That's the good thing. So we all have a view inside but there also has to be a two-way communication with the citizens. Mm -hmm. You can't just do this thing and it be mandated from on high. It's gotta be at the local level, right? To some extent, which is why I guess it's a smart city. And then it also has to be something where we get a say-so. We, the people get a say-so in it. It can't be mandated. Can't, and it can't, also can't be forced down our throat. We talk about change management, you know, and, and that whole, the concept of, of Rogers bell curve, that's a, that's a philosophy in change management also. You've got to get people to buy in and let them be the early adopters and educate them so that they can be your champions. And, and you really have to, we have, we've got to think about that. But I, I know, Eric, I know you don't like it. I know, I know. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, okay. Come on, okay, now I got to ask you this, all right, because you said you'll give up your privacy. Okay, listen. 
All right. How much of it are you willing to give up? Okay, let's just say, for instance, um, let's say you had an expired tag, an expired tag. Okay, you 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 forgot, you know, or whatever. You've been traveling or something like that. And because you know, whatever your surveillance, and it has the entire block there, it dings your car. All the cars, all the license plates have chips on them, and yours wasn't updated. And you know you get a ding on your phone. Hey, you have been ticketed for X Y because you haven't. You know, and and the only reason why I'm bringing that in is because I do get it, and I'm with you too. Especially anytime we can ensure safety, especially deter crime, especially horrible crimes like you know human trafficking and all those sort of things. Absolutely. Um, I also know that <laughs> you know there's an arc that goes where I get to the point where now we're going to invite people in and then we're going to they're going to bring their own different ethics. I remember this having this conversation. I remember one time when I stayed in this one place and um, they had an HOA. Good grief! And the the things that these people would talk about that they wanted to regulate. I'm like, would you just let people live on their own and leave it alone? Yeah. And and that's my point. Like we're now. Now we're going to wrap this up into another level, and that's just my concern. It's a trade. But something, something like the expired tags. There are rules and laws. People should follow them. So yeah. I'm, a, I, I believe in that. So something like the tags, they let you know well in advance when the damn tag is due. I knew the tag on time, right? <laughs> so I think the problem we have is we've already got a false sense of privacy, right? It's not real. They know everything about us already. And so it, it, you're not really giving up as much as you think because we already did that. Before we understood how important our data was, we gave it away already. And so what the little bit that's left, at least let's have a say so in it. Yeah, I think this is all about having a seat at the table. So um, we talked a few weeks ago with regards to. Um, Colorado and the group of people that got together for the legislation and like presented, they were a group of entrepreneurs and citizens and they got together and they presented the legislators with their recommendations of how blockchain could be used in the state of Colorado. And we see that happening all over the place. A part of what you're saying, Eric, is that there is a need for representation. Now, I started thinking about this in terms of, as, as Tawana was talking, um, police brutality, okay, is, a, is, is something that we've been talking about, right, as, as a community. And the body cams are great. That's one thing. However, the body cams show a perspective. So the body cams is like the next step. However, the smart cities being able to, oh, there's a police encounter happening, or oh, someone's drawing a gun, whether it's a police or not, or oh, they may get to a point where they can sense drug deals happening without the cops being there at all, or things like that that are happening. Um, I think that there, Swan is right, there's a false sense of privacy, but then mm -hmm. there are also things that if we're in the room as black people and we're fighting for you know, good, decent, hard, work, hard working black people that just so happen to be poor, they can't help where they live. Mm -hmm. And we say, you know what, we wanna protect those citizens. Um, mm -hmm. Then, we're able to take this smart city technology and do something worthwhile for it so that you don't have another Atatiana Jefferson mm -hmm. um, situation, you know, or Tamir Rice, you know, mm -hmm. the extremes like that. Um, but, but it is about us kind of thinking, having this conversation really, you know, in terms of economics, which is what, BBC focuses on a lot of the time, but also some of the social justice, okay. the healthcare justice that we can get, um, you know, all the other injustices that, that people have because the majority of our people are the poorest people in, 
in the country? Mm -hmm. And then how can we take these smart technologies and help with economic injustice, you know? Um, Shuri, can I say I 100% agree with this because let's just be honest, cities could be run better. And I'm not just talking about the cities that have, you know, a lot of money and have a lot of rich people to live. They could be run better. So possibly the application of, of you know, this technology of smart cities could allow some of those cities that are really lagging behind. It's funny, we talk about laggers. There's laggers in cities too. This is mm-hmm. not just individuals. Yeah, so, like whole cities. That's what I was talking about with the whole right. cities. Yeah. Yes, that are totally behind. And you're going, why are you not up to date? And, and you know, I, even, you know, living where I live in, in the southern part of Virginia, um, you know, at times when we have like the big storms, which we know hap- happen quite frequently here on the East Coast, um, you know, we have issues with flooding and those sort of things. We have parts of the city that flood and sometimes certain neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, marginalized neighborhoods of flood and then you know it's a big problem and I'm like oh, man why can't we get this straight we, we yeah. know what's happening right? you know the storm's coming right it's you, know, coming. you know the storm's oh, coming yeah. what is or it or even afterwards they have to go now and do so I grew up in Louisiana so anytime there's a hurricane I pay attention to that and they have to go and do door to door house to house searches whenever there are big storms You know, imagine a smart city where we can see, okay, the people that need to be rescued are in these houses over here. And you're, so this is where I think, I don't know if um, CNBC meant that it would save 19 billion across all cities or 19 billion per city. Per city, yeah. Um, I, I thought he was trying to say per city. Well, yeah, that's, that's a heck of a savings because you're going to be saving on manpower, on time. They're going to increase their revenues as well because they're going to give more tickets, you know, um, there'll be more safety, but then there are these other downsides that are going to come from the smart cities. If we're going to want to call them downsides. You won't be able to hide in the shadows right. as much. Like, you know, it's, it's, it was easy in the 60s, 50s, maybe even the 70s, that if you wanted to go hide somewhere, you could. <laughs> Today, it's harder. You could do it, but it's infinitely harder. When you get to smart cities, it's going to be even impossible. Harder. Yeah. Yeah. What does make me nervous, though, is the vulnerabilities, right? So the city's smart until it's not. Right. <laughs> until till the out till there's a power outage and there's there's nothing or until there's a cyber attack and then everything is is so technology driven that we can't even, you know, eat or cook or anything, all the basic things because we've depended on technology so heavy. So that does make me a little nervous with this. You know, at some we still have to be able to do some things on our own that are not tech dependent. Or we're gonna we're gonna set ourselves up for a problem because the cyber attacks will happen, or at least the attempts. I yeah. I agree. Yeah. It, 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 it's funny because my you know um, my best friend Lauren he's in the group and he was replying in the chat. Uh, Lauren's in the energy sector, so he works for Dominion Power, and you know it's funny because you know we lose power and, and that sort of thing. But and and I saw that he mentioned earlier how they're having a discussion about going to the smart grid about transition to a smart grid but man i i just wonder you know just when it came down to attacks i mean now you can hold an entire city hostage i mean i, I don't you know i don't know but at the same time it does it, it does need to be addressed and upgraded i know when storms happen it's it's a consistent thing that parts of the city will lose power yeah, kind of look at that. And you go, man. How could we make this is still happening? Like it, like you know. But it's kind of one of those things. I do want to say something because um, Chris McFarland, she didn't mention something that I, I look and I go, okay, this should be an, a no brainer. And and that is voting on the blockchain is a no brainer to me. Mm-hmm. Like like how that like all of the problems that happen, and here we go now where the stakes are going to be super high. You know, come you know next November, and and and, and you have to think about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is almost making me laugh. 
regardless of what happens, <laughs> somebody's going to say somebody cheated. Of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. But you know, somebody's going to say. <laughs> and not, not just the presidential elections, all the Senate, the, the state senators, the mayors. Yes, yes, yeah. they will. But I do think, so this is a conspiracy theorist in me. Um, if you made, if you put voting on the blockchain and if you made blockchain, sorry, if you made voting easier, um, and, and I'm not saying Democrat or Republican, I personally think, I personally think the Republicans will have a problem with it. Um, just because, because, because more people would do it, more people would vote or even more stay in and do would it. Vote and the people that are not voting now are younger and browner. And if you gave them equal access to voting, it would really flip things to a point where they don't want it. Again, not to turn this political, Republican, right. Democrat, don't, I, I don't even, to me, they're both the same party. That's just I my But just think I about, that's a good point. Think about if voting was allowed on a mobile app. Yeah, it, it, you can wake up. You happen. can wake up on election day. And you click. can do it before you got up. Mm -hmm. You just click and you go on with your day. Employers won't have to give the four hours that we got to figure out how we giving everybody. You That's know, people don't have right. to decide. Do I want to go stand on the line? I don't feel like standing on the line. I mean, people can literally click a button. Your vote will count, and you move about your day. And you work for an employer that will give people the four hours. There are a lot of minimum wage people who cannot afford, because they're working two jobs, yep. they cannot afford to take the time off and their vote doesn't count. Right? Yep. So, you um, know, I mean, let's be real here, but we got nine minutes left. So I wanna end this on a positive note and talk about opportunity for us, because that's what we do with NBBC. Um, one of the first things that uh, came, uh, about, I think Eric was talking a little bit and it just spurred, uh, spurred this in my head was uh, there was an app that did the facial recognition and they didn't test it on any black people. Mm -hmm. um, they only use white and Asian people because that's who was in the test group. And when black people, like they released it and when black people used it, it said we were gorillas and all of that. Um, I do think that part of the opportunity that we have within the smart cities is to be part of these beta groups, to be part of these legislative groups. And I'm saying in terms of making money, being consultants for diversity when it comes to how smart cities um, and the blockchain relate with each other. I see that as a huge, huge opportunity for us. I just showed you all of the big companies that are getting involved. You could do it from the corporate side. You could do it as an independent consultant and thought leader. You could do it from the city side in terms of protecting the city. Because let me tell you, the first black person that is falsely accused because of these smart cameras wow. that are here, yeah. That they, they the you think the cities are paying now for the um you know swapping of the DNA and police brutality and all of that. Let them falsely accuse somebody with their smart city supposed to be, you know, uh yeah, they're gonna be paying through the nose. Yeah. So um there's a lot of opportunities if you want to look at it from a black social justice point of view. There are also just opportunities if you want to look at it from an economic point of view. Um, they, they, in all of the articles that I've, I've read, you know, they talk about transportation, they talk about energy, they talk about some of the um, surveillance uh, items that are going to be coming and just making city life easier for the city as well as its citizens. You could choose to educate citizens or you could choose to educate the city and the city officials. There's a ton of different opportunities that are available with, um, with smart cities while understanding that the blockchain is probably going to be the underlying um, 
technology that brings internet of things, smart cities, artificial intelligence, robotics, brings it all together. So um, with that, you know, either one of you can talk about some of the opportunities that you see, you know, talk to the family here. I do have one thing that I do want to point out, and, and this was also in Chrissy's article, is she mentioned Augury Square, and with, I, I didn't, I, I never knew about that. And for those, for those of you who are Atlanteans, um, I would love to, you know, know. Um, and, and I guess she said it's, it's going to be a blockchain, like an area of the city that's completely connected by the blockchain. And I'm just really intrigued. I went to the site. Uh, that they had there, but I guess it's just more of a of a splash site, so they don't have really kind of any uh, info on on how it's going to work. But I'm really interested to see um, because Sounds that like we need to take a field trip when we go to Atlanta in February. I, so. <laughs> I would I would love to do. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I wanted to throw that out there. I, I would love for us to go there and just to, and just look at the area and just kind of just even see because I was like, wow, that's that was a that was the first time that I'd heard about it and. Um, you know the, the the link in her article led you to the announcement and it looked like this only happened like in september was when this was announced so this is a brand new initiative it's going to be really intriguing to see how how that works and, and they talked about even cryptocurrency being a part of it so i'm like wow so how's that going to work you know so yeah it, that doesn't surprise me which mm -hmm. is why i think facebook is going so hard for the stable coins yeah. And and I don't know if you all saw the news, but they they're dismantling Libra, and instead they're buying a term with a lot of di different stable coins. Uh, but it wouldn't surprise me if if uh, a crypto currency that's probably used across the United States is going to emerge uh, from this, or whether they're going to use the the tether or something like that. Um, but well, go ahead, Tawana. I would just say as my final comment is, if you have any interest in cybersecurity at all, this is the time to, to dive deep and learn it and start a business. Because for me, that's the, that's the industry that is going to thrive if mm -hmm. smart cities start popping up. Yeah. And the truth is, you don't really need to know a lot within cybersecurity to be top 20%. I would say aim for top 20%, you know, just as a start and then eventually work your way up. Uh, but there are, now I don't know this for sure, but I got it from a reliable source. There are even in certain cities, if you go to your community college, they will give you free classes in cybersecurity and network administration because they want, um, these cities are trying to attract uh, high tech companies to come in. Mm. And what they do is say, you know, we have this workforce of people that are able to, um, uh, that are, you know, certified, qualified, able to, to do the jobs. And the person I heard this from was in Austin. However, you should check with your community college. If you want to get into cybersecurity, it's never too late. You're not too old, you know, go talk to the people at your community college because you may be able to get some certifications uh, for free, get you a good entry level job, work your way up, say that you wanna work with smart cities and cybersecurity. There's a lot of opportunity that's out there. Yeah, that's a good point. And it could be a good opportunity to um, partner with someone. So, mm -hmm. you know, find someone who knows cybersecurity but not blockchain mm -hmm. and you're the blockchain specialist and together, it's a powerhouse team. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay, everybody. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's convo. Um, and if you're a geek uh, like we are, I'm sure you're going to do more research on smart cities. I think it's something to watch out for. Uh, jobs will be changing. Oh, this is another thing. If you work for your city government, if you work for your city government, Watch out for this because if you have the type of job that these smart cities will replace and you're 40, 35, mm -hmm. my suggestion to you is you start looking to pivot because in about five years, 
once blockchain, you know, and, um, and IoT gets their footing, and once some of these cities start um, having success stories, your city may be coming in to it. So, you know, a lot of times we get chopped off first because we have those types of jobs that, that you know, it's just redundant with the technology. So that's another big thing as well. Okay. So um, we are also trying to grow our YouTube <laughs> channel. So if you would like our YouTube channel, if you're watching this on YouTube or, you know, if you can go, uh, Black Blockchain Consultants is our YouTube channel. And then uh, next week we have Doc, uh, Professor uh, Lou who's coming on. He is a machine learning and blockchain consultant with Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's a Johns Hopkins professor as well, so that should be really good too. So you can Absolutely. come on back next uh, next Wednesday and join us. Thank you so much, everybody, and I hope you have a wonderful and blessed evening. And don't forget the conference, Atlanta, uh, February 16th and 17th. Go to the website, and then also the virtual conference that will air on December the 4th. Yes. How about you just join the inner circle and we don't have to keep reminding you because then you'll know about all of these things. Yes, we're, we're, we're going to send out multiple, uh, multiple reminders about all of these things. So thanks, guys. Thank you, Jeffrey. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Take guys. Care. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.